Well, good morning, everyone. I hope that everybody is doing well this morning, church family. Um, and it's good to see you. Uh, I wish that I could be looking out the congregation right now and see all your faces. Um, but for now, we just thank the Lord that we have this, this technology to stay connected uh, through uh, the Facebook. But I, I will tell you, while you're not here physically, uh, as I'm preaching, I'm just imagining each of your faces. I, I know where most of you you sit, and so uh, just know that as I'm, I'm preaching, I'm seeing your faces. And for those of you who are, who are joining us who are not part of First Baptist uh, family, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning as, uh, as, we, as we set time aside to worship uh, the Lord. He is worthy of our worship, and we just want to celebrate and worship him through singing and in a few moments through the preaching of, of God's word. But before we start in our time of worship, I want to give a few uh, announcements for the church family. Obviously, uh, next Sunday is Easter Sunday and the, the schedule that we had planned um, is, is going to be different. Unless God chooses this week to, to miraculously heal this, this virus and completely take it away next Sunday morning. We're still going to celebrate. We're still going to worship. Nothing changes the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, and that is our hope. And so next Sunday morning, we will celebrate Easter Sunday through uh, Facebook uh, once again as we just, uh, again, celebrate the hope that is ours as believers in Jesus Christ, knowing that our Savior uh, lives. I want to encourage everyone in the church family to continue to pray. Uh, continue to pray for one another, pray for our nation, pray for all the needs that uh, so many have during this time. I want to encourage you to, to continue to reach out, stay connected with one another, uh, minister to each other's needs. If you, if you hear of a need that requires uh, our attention, by all means, call the church office and let us know because we want to minister to those needs the best that we can. And also, we want to continue giving. Thank you for those of you who have been faithfully giving during uh, this difficult time, but I just want to encourage you to continue to give your tithes and offerings so that we can continue ministry here at First Baptist uh, Church. Tonight, we will have our worship service again via uh, Facebook at 6 p.m., and then Wednesday evening, we'll have our Wednesday evening prayer service at 6.30 p.m. I apologize for those of you who, who logged on this past Wednesday at 6.30 We we had some technical difficulties. Apologize about that, but hopefully we've gotten all that uh, worked out. So this morning as we, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I want us to remember to pray for several things. Obviously, we want to pray for our nation. We want to pray for healing upon our nation. We, we are praying diligently for our doctors, nurses, all those who are working um, so tirelessly in, in during this during this difficult time, we, we want to pray for the medical industry. We certainly want to pray for those who are sick. Not only do we have, obviously, many who have been in, infected by the virus, but right now is a, is a difficult time. To, they say that this is, uh, this is one of the worst allergy seasons that we've had in a long time. And so, so many of us are, are battling allergies and, and other type of illnesses. So we, we want to pray for healing. We want to pray for our leaders, our president, our governors, that they will have, have wisdom and courage as they lead. And we pray that they will look to the Lord for their guidance as they lead us. Something else as I was thinking about uh, this morning is uh, we want to pray for all of our students, our students and our, our teachers that have been affected uh, by this. This is a difficult and challenging time for them. And so remember them as you, as you pray in your devotional time. Pray for our students and pray for all of our, our teachers who are not able, not able to have a class right now. Also, we, we certainly are praying that during this, God will use this to bring revival and awakening to our churches and to our nation as a whole so that God's great name would be glorified and shine brightly through this whole um, thing. Well, before we go to the Lord in prayer, I wanna read a passage of scripture out of the Gospel of Luke. This comes from Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 29 and through verse 40. This is, uh, this is Luke's account of the triumphal in entry. This is what the church calls Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday that we remember 
that final week of Jesus' life, and specifically on that, on that uh, Sunday when Jesus marched into, um, into Jerusalem, that final time. He didn't march in as a, as a commanding warrior, but he, he came in as a humble servant. And uh, so many things would happen on that final week of Jesus' life. And most importantly, we know that his death and his resurrection would happen. And that's what gives us our hope, as, I, as I've already said. So listen to these words as I, as I read out of Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, his owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawn near already on the way down to Mount, the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, this new day that you have given us. You've given us life so that once again we can live to accomplish your purpose so that we can live for your glory. And this morning as we gather together corporately through this technology that you have blessed us with, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us in our faith. Lord, we want to pray for our nation. We continue to ask for healing upon our nation, for those who have been infected by the, the virus, and for so many others who are just battling other illnesses. Lord, we pray for their healing. Lord, we pray for our doctors, all of the medical personnel, all the nurses. We thank you that that they are working so hard to meet the needs of the people. And we just ask for your strength and blessing to be upon them. Lord, we pray for our leaders, pray for our president, our governors. Lord, we ask that you would give them wisdom, that they would look to you for their direction as they lead the people that you, you've given them to lead. Uh, Lord, we, we pray, Father, that you would accomplish your will through this. Lord, we know that you have a purpose behind all things, and we know that you will work in every detail of our lives. And, and Lord, we thank you that we can stand firmly and confidently today knowing that you are on your throne and that your, your purposes and, and what, you, what you declare will happen will happen. And so may we stand firmly on that. And so, Lord, today, as, as we worship you, we, we ask, Lord Jesus, that if there is anyone who's listening today who they don't have the hope of knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would open their ears and open their eyes to the reality of the gospel, that today they would cry out to you. Lord, I pray for your church pray that you would encourage us as your church, that you would minister to us. I pray for the needs that, that we all have, Lord, those burdens, those private burdens that, that we may be carrying, Lord, we cast them at your feet and we thank, we're so thankful that you love us and that you care for us. And Lord, as I'm praying about burdens and needs, Lord, I, I pray for all of our students and teachers that have been affected by this. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you would help them through this challenging um, time and that they can quickly get back to pursuing their education. Uh, Lord, we, we just ask, Father, that, uh, that you would glorify yourself through us 
that as your people, we would, we would be the people you've called us to be. You tell us in, the, in your word that we're to be the salt and light in this world so that people ultimately will see Christ in us. And so, Lord, we give you this service. We pray that everything that happens here will bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, Brother Mark is going to come and lead us in worship through song.
This morning, we're going to talk about this issue of faith as we look at Daniel chapter 3. Now, this is a narrative. This is a long text, so we're not going to look at this verse by verse, but we're going to look at it as a, as a whole. You know, when it comes to faith, in reality, everybody ultimately lives by faith in something. The question is, what or who is the object of your faith? Faith is not, or at least a biblical faith, um, is not believing in the best possible outcome. Faith is not positive thinking. It's not blind optimism, but true biblical faith. The, the faith that we are called to as, as believers has God as its object. It is believing God and trusting and obeying His Word no matter what the circumstances may be. I like what one individual said regarding faith. They said, faith is resting your whole weight on God. That's a great way to sum up the biblical faith that we see illustrated in our, our text um, today. And so as we look at this story in the book of Daniel, we are given a beautiful picture of, of faith, a beautiful demonstration of what it means to, to live by faith. Now, in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we're given the context of this story. In, in, this, in this time in history, the nation of Israel, the land of Judah, had been taken into captivity underneath the Babylonians. And the ruler of the Babylonians was King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was, was known to be a, a prideful uh, king. He was a, he was a, mass, uh, uh, a mighty uh, king who ruled a, a mighty nation. And in Daniel chapter 3, at the beginning of, of verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura. So this was a golden image of some sort of God. Many Bible scholars believe that perhaps this was a statue of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And this was a really, really large statue. If you convert the cubits into our, our measurement uh, that we use today, this statue stood 90 feet tall and was about 9 feet in circumference. So this was a very, very large um, image, statue. And the, the command was given by King Nebuchadnezzar that when the people heard the music play, they were to fall on their faces and give homage to this false god, this image. And sure enough, as the people heard the music, they all fell down and worshipped the image. But we see in our text that there were three Jewish men who demonstrated amazing faith. While everybody else was following the king's command, and giving homage to this false image. These three Jewish men held firm to their faith. And they, they demonstrated an unshakable faith. Now, when you, when you read the book of Daniel, so much emphasis is placed on the Old Testament prophet Daniel. And certainly Daniel was a mighty man of faith. But... It's interesting to note that in this story, nowhere is Daniel mentioned at all. And that is certainly not by accident. I believe that Daniel is left out of this story because God wants to make it clear that these three Jewish men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stood on their own faith. They were not standing on the faith of Daniel. But this was their own conviction. They had... A, a, a solid conviction grounded in God's word that there was only one true God, God Almighty. And so as we study this story, that again gives us a, a wonderful illustration of what it means to walk by faith, the story really unfolds in four different sections. 
And so we're going to look at each one of these sections. And with each one of these sections, we find a different lesson on genuine biblical faith. So the first part of the story comes in verses 8 through 18. And that is where we find the unshakable faith of the men. The unshakable faith of the men. Now we see in, in, in these verses that these men face a certain situation. There was a situation that they faced that challenged their faith. First of all, we see that they faced this accusation. They were accused. Verse 8 says that therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came before the king and maliciously accused the Jews. Specifically, verse 12, it says there are these, these Jewish men, or these, excuse me, these Chaldeans come before the king. And they say in verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not deserve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so here are these Chaldeans. They come before Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, they're trying to kiss up to the king. They, they, refer, they, they say, O king, live forever. They were jealous, by the way, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because these three Jewish men had found favor in the eyes of the king and they had actually been promoted. And so jealousy is what is driving the motives of these Chaldeans. And so they make this accusation and they say, O king, there are, there are these Jewish men who refuse to obey your command. And when the music plays, they refuse to, to give homage um, to the statue that you have erected. So then we see that these, these Jewish men, not only were they accused, but then we see that they were questioned. They were brought before the king, verse 13. And it says that King Nebuchadnezzar was absolutely furious. And he commanded these three Jewish men to be brought before him. And he asked them a simple question. In verse 14 it says that he said to them, is this true? Is this true? These men had been very loyal to King Nebuchadnezzar. Again, that's why they had found favor in his, in his sight. They had been promoted. But now the king is, is astonished. He, he cannot believe that these three men had, had refused to obey his command. And so in verse 15, we see that they were threatened. The king says, but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So now put yourself in these, these uh, three men place. Think about what they could have done in this situation to justify compromising their conviction. They could have said, well, we will, we will bow physically, but in our hearts, God will know that we only worship Him. They could have said, well, the King has been so good to us, we can't possibly offend Him by violating His command, because that would be unloving. Or they could have said, well, well, God will forgive us because God knows the situation and he knows that we are only doing this because we are being forced against our wills. Or they could have said, well, everybody else is doing it. So therefore, we need to do this as well. Or they could have justified bowing before the false idol by saying, if we don't, we will die, and, and, and God needs us to, to help the other Jewish people. So it's amazing how when we face temptation to compromise, that we will find all kinds of ways to justify compromising. But we find here that these men were unshakable in their faith. They would not compromise their conviction that God and God alone was God Almighty, and He alone was the only one that they would bow to. And so we see in verses 16 through 18 that these men take a stand. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. They're, they're not being um, uh, 
arrogant here. They're just simply saying, we have nothing, we have no response to this. We have no defense to this. What you're saying is, is true. Yes, we have done this. We have refused the command. We will not bow to a false god. Verse 17, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold idol that you have set up. Wow, what unshakable faith that these men had. In the face of death, in the face of this danger, this, this threat, that if, that if they did not obey, they would be, they would be thrown in the fiery uh, furnace. They stood firm. They trusted in the power of God. They, they said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. You notice they didn't say he will deliver us. But they just simply said, we, we have faith that our God has the power to deliver us if he is willing. So they trusted in the power of God and they had faith in the will of God. They didn't say, now we're going to trust God if he delivers us. But they, in essence, said, we are going to, to trust our God no matter what. If he delivers us, wonderful. If he chooses to allow us to perish in the fire, it's okay because we trust the will of the Lord. Their faith was not in their deliverance, but their faith was in their God. No matter what, they would trust God. Nothing could shake them from their faith in God. Simply because, and don't miss this, they feared God more than they feared man or they feared death. And so the lesson that we get from this is, is that genuine faith will always be tested. To test means literally to prove by trial. So church, we know that our faith will be tested. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So, so Peter here is saying, don't be surprised. Don't think it is something strange is happening to you because you are facing a test. It is something that we can expect. Now, we face tests of all kinds of varieties. Our faith is tested uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, one, probably one of the most common ways that our faith is tested is through difficulty, through hardship, through personal trials, through sufferings, through, through tragedies, through health issues, through financial issues, through relational issues, marital issues. All those kinds of difficulties test our faith. Uh, our faith as believers sometimes is tested by what I call opportunities. When God calls us to specific tasks and, and, and he tests us to see if we will trust him or not. Most of the time when God calls us as believers to do something, it is far greater than what we perceive that we can do. And that is because God wants to see if we're going to trust him to enable us, to equip us to do what he has called us to do. Uh, the Bible says that we will be tested through persecution. That we will be persecuted for our faith, just like these three uh, Jewish men. Sometimes our faith is just simply tested through delays. When we're crying out to God for an answer and we don't get the answer right away, He tests us through delays and certainly we face tests through temptations. I read a story about a nurse and this was her first day on the job. And the story went like this. It says a young nurse on her first day told the surgeon he had used 12 sponges, but she could not account for, but she could only account for 11. The doctor firmly announced that he had removed them all. The young woman insisted that one was missing, but the doctor grimly declared he would proceed with the, 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 the surgery and he would, he would sew the, the person up. The nurse, with her eyes blazing, said, You cannot do that. Think of the patient. The doctor smiled, lifting his foot, showing the nurse the twelfth sponge which he had deliberately dropped to the floor. And he said, You'll do. He had been trusting her, or he had been testing her, 
to see if she had the courage and integrity to carry out the duties of her positions. So church, know that we, if we have genuine faith, our faith will be tested. Well, we move to the next section of the story, the next unfolding, this next scene of the story. And we see the uncontrollable rage of the king in verses 19 through 23. The uncontrollable rage of the king. We see the king was absolutely filled with rage when these three Jewish men refused to bow to his image. He was filled with anger and rage. Verse 20 or verse 19 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury so much that the expression of his face or his face even changed. So you could see the anger on his faith. You know, there was something on that day that was even hotter than the furnace. It was the face of the king. He was boiling. He was spewing with this uncontrolled anger. Not only did this king have a problem with, with ego and pride, but this king had a problem with uncontrolled anger. You know, when we are filled with uncontrolled anger, we do really foolish things. And, and we see in the story that the king, because he was filled with uncontrolled anger, he does some really foolish things. Listen to what it says that he, he did. It said that he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, think about this. He's wanting these men to suffer for their disobedience. Now, if he really wanted them to suffer for their disobedience, instead of heating the furnace up where they would be immediately incinerated and put out of their misery, it would have made more sense for him to cool the furnace down so that they would linger in their pain. But instead, because of his uncontrolled rage, he heats the furnace up, it says seven times hotter. In other words, as hot as they could possibly get it, he, he heated the furnace up. And then it says that he did something else very, very foolish. After he, he orders the, the furnace to be heated up, it says that he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were left in their clothes. Again, he is, he is filled with uncontrolled anger here. Here's how, he's not going to wait. He's going to throw them in just as they are right there. He throws them in with their, their, their tunics on, their clothes on, even their hats. They were bound together and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And the Bible says that when the furnace door was opened, that the fire was so hot that his choice men lost their lives. Again, another very foolish thing. Some of his, some of his best warriors in his army, he killed because he was filled with this uncontrolled uh, range, uh, uh, rage and anger. So we see the king's anger but also we see the faithful's suffering. They are thrown into the fiery furnace. And so what do, we, what do we learn from this? What is the second lesson that we learn about genuine faith? Well, genuine faith will always be afflicted. It will always be tested. But mark it down, genuine faith will always be afflicted. There is no such thing, there is no teaching in the Bible that says that you can have, as followers of Christ, a pain-free life. Mark it down. God never promises us that faith will guard us from pain. But instead, He allows us to be afflicted because He uses our affliction in order to grow us as followers of Christ. Job, in Job 13, verse 15, said this, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. So we see here that no matter what God allowed these men to, be, to, to face, no matter what affliction these men would face, these men's faith would grow through the affliction. And we know that while we are promised that our faith will be tested and that we will be afflicted for our faith. We know that no affliction 
can come to us unless it first passes through the sovereign hands of God. So in other words, while God allows affliction in our lives, affliction has to get God's permission first. Well, now let's move to the, to the third scene in our story. So, so we've seen the unshakable faith of the men. We've seen the uncontrollable rage of the king. Now in verses 24 through 25, we see the unmistakable hand of the Lord. When the, when the three men are thrown to the fiery furnace, some things happen that, that it's unmistakable not to see the hand of God. It is absolutely impossible not to see the hand of God at work uh, protecting these three men's Live. Notice what the text says in verse 24. It says, after the men had been thrown in the fiery furnace, verse 24, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rises up, and he declares to his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? To which they said, Yes, that is true. And then the king says, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the the fire. There was a fourth man in the fire. Now, Bible scholars have, have speculated exactly who was the fourth man. Was it an angel of the Lord? Or some believe that it was actually a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus Christ himself. That Jesus Christ was, was walking in the furnace with these men. We, we cannot say for sure, but what we can say is that this was God Almighty in the furnace with these men. And the reality is, is that these men, because God was with them, they were safer in the fire than outside of the fire if they had compromised. And we see the miracle. The text goes on to speak of, of, uh, of the miracle. We, again, he says, I see four men unbound walking in the fire. So these men are not lying down in the fire, but they are walking around in the fire. The fire. So the unmistakable hand of the Lord. The Lord was with these men as they faced their affliction. As they faced the king's rage and the heat of the furnace, God Almighty was with them. And so here we find this third lesson on genuine faith, and that is this. Genuine faith will always be strengthened, or you could say genuine faith will always be purified. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we know that while our faith will be tested, and while our faith will be afflicted, we know that genuine faith will always be strengthened. It will always be purified. It will always be made stronger through the trials that we face. I like what Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said. He said, trial is the channel of many blessings. So how is it that God uses trials in order to strengthen our faith. Well, I want to give you four of them, very quickly, four of them. Four ways that God strengthens our faith through trials and afflictions. Number one, God strengthens our faith by using trials to affirm our faith. He uses trials to affirm our faith. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 says, in this you greatly rejoice. Peter says, in your trial, in your affliction, greatly rejoice because even though now for a while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof, you hear that? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. And so what Peter is teaching us here is, is that we can rejoice in our trials because we know that in trials, God uses trials to affirm our faith, 
to prove to us as believers that we have true faith. So trials give us opportunities to prove to God and to prove to ourselves that we really have faith. And that helps to build a confident faith. Well, number two, God strengthens our faith by using trials to purify our faith. To purify our, our faith. Notice Peter, in, in that verse that I just read, compares our faith to, to, precious, to precious gold. And just like gold that is refined in a furnace, as the, as the, as the gold is heated up, the impurities rise to the top and are taken away. We know that our faith in the furnace of affliction is purified. God removes those things in our lives that are hindering our faith, uh, that, that keep our faith from, from being the faith that he wants us um, to have. So, so in the midst of trials, God exposes what is in our hearts. The book of 2 Chronicles 32-31 speaks of Hezekiah. King Hezekiah loved the Lord, but King Hezekiah developed pride. And the Bible says that, that Hezekiah was tested by God in order for him to see the pride in his heart. So he shows us, or he exposes to us, what is in our hearts in the midst of affliction in order to set us free from those things that serve as roadblocks in our faith. Psalm 119, 71, the psalmist said, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So again, it is in affliction that oftentimes we are set free from those hindrances in our life. In the text, you notice it says that when they were cast into the fire, they were bound together. But then in the midst of the fire, their bindings were loosed. It was in the midst of the fire is where they were set free. And so often, church, it is in the midst of the hottest furnaces of our life that God uses those difficult times in order to set us free. Perhaps he's using what we're going through right now to set you free from fear. He wants to use this to set you, set you free from worry. He's, he's showing us, and I believe, and I can say this confidently, that when this is over, we're going to be able to look back and see that, yes, he is a mighty God and he can be trusted. He uses affliction to set us free from unforgiveness. He uses affliction the, the fiery furnace to set us free from anger. Sometimes he uses the fiery furnace to set us free from addiction, to set us free from pride, to set us free from self-reliance. You know what happens to believers when they finally get to, the, to that place where there's nowhere they can turn. There's no other source of security that they can turn to but God Almighty. It is in those times that God sets us free from self-reliance. It is the temptation that we all face to rely upon ourselves. But God wants us to fully rely upon Him. And so trials have a way of purifying us in order to show us those things in our hearts that need to be repentant of, to be removed so that we are conformed more into His image. Well, another way that God strengthens our faith is he uses trials to refocus our faith. To refocus our faith. He uses the furnaces of our life in order to refocus our attention back onto him. J.C. Ryle once said, Trials are intended to make us think, to wean us from the world, to send us to the Bible, to drive us to our knees. So it's in difficulty that, that God uses the, the hardships of life to take our focus off of the world and get us back focused on to God. And this is my great prayer. That through this furnace that we're all going through, that God would use this to get our focus back on Him. Paul said in Colossians 3.2, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on 
the earth. Number four, and finally, how does God strengthen our faith in the midst of trials? We strengthen our faith through trials by building our faith. Think about these men. These men went away from this experience knowing that God was with them no matter what. And you know what? There are things that we will go through that, that are so difficult and so hard that it is only as we face those times that we will, we will experience special grace that God will provide us unique to that situation that will carry us through. And after we've gone through it, then our faith will be strengthened as we experience that special grace. Well, the, we move to the fourth and final scene of the story. And that is the undeniable impact of the miracle. The undeniable impact of the miracle. And we find this in verses 26 through 30. There was an undeniable impact that this miracle had that God used to work in different people's lives. We see that there was an undeniable impact on the king, on the king himself. Now, this is Nebuchadnezzar. And on a surface reading of the text, you could say, well, this was the point where Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that all, all false gods are false and that there is only one true God. But this is, not, this is not really what is happening here. Nebuchadnezzar is not turning from all his false gods. He's just uh, acknowledging uh, that, he's just acknowledging the reality of God Almighty. But he's still, at this place, he's still not turning fully to God. But he acknowledged God. Verse 28, it says that, um, that Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26, commands Shadrach and Meshach to come out of the furnace. They come out of the furnace. All the, all the, the counselors and all the king's men were there. It's interesting. God had an audience here to witness his mighty power. They see that not one of their, their garments were soiled with the smell of smoke. None of their, the hair on their heads was singed. They were perfectly okay. In verse 28, God, or Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God where he says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants. He acknowledged God Almighty. And then he also respected these men's faith. He acknowledged these men's faith in verse uh, 28. He says, who, referring to Shadrach and, Meshach, and Meshach, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he acknowledged that they trusted in the Lord to deliver uh, them. And then something, something wonderful happens here. Nebuchadnezzar starts the story out with a decree that all must bow to this false god and the story ends with Nebuchadnezzar giving this de decree that nobody could speak evil of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So their worship was protected. So this is Romans 8.28 being displayed right before us. All things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his plan and, and perfect, uh, perfect will. So God worked in the heart of of Nebuchadnezzar. He's working in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. This was not the, the point of Nebuchadnezzar's salvation. I believe we find that in chapter 4. But God is using this miracle in order to begin to work in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. To begin to open his eyes to the reality of God Almighty. But something else happens that is undeniable. There was an undeniable impact by the miracle. And we see that God was impacted by the miracle. Verse 30, it says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So what happens here? God took notice of these men's faith. And through a pagan king, he rewarded these men for their faithfulness. And so what is the final lesson that we get regarding faith? Through this story. Well it's simply this. Genuine faith will always be 
noticed. Genuine faith will always be noticed. Genuine faith will always have an impact. People are always watching us in our faith. Unbelievers, when we stand firm in our faith, uh, see uh, that we are, we are trusting in the Lord God Almighty, that our faith is in Christ, in Christ alone. And unbelievers are impacted, just like Nebuchadnezzar was impacted. Believers, when we stand firm in our faith, we encourage other believers to stand courageous in their own walk of faith. And then certainly, uh, we know that we have an audience because as I said just a moment ago, God is always watching us. He takes notice of our faith. When we refuse to compromise our faith, God takes notice and he blesses us and he promises us that he will reward us for our faith. Now that doesn't mean that faith guarantees us a prosperity down here. But it does tell us that God takes notice of our faithfulness and that our faithfulness, our faith proves that we have truly trusted in him. And so therefore we, we know that he will reward us, if not on this side of the glory, certainly we know that we will be re rewarded on the other side when we will forever uh, live with him. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So God is always watching us, and he is faithful to reward us for our obedience and our faith. Well, in closing, we all know, I don't have to tell you, we are all right now walking in the midst of a fiery furnace. We're all in the midst of facing some very difficult and trying times. This story challenges us in our faith. How will we respond as we go through this difficult time? How will we respond in our faith? Uh, I, I believe this story challenges our faith. Will we stand firm? And trust the Lord no matter what the outcome is? Will we allow this, this difficulty to, to be used by God to grow us, to purify us in this time? Church, we must embrace this difficulty. We must allow the Lord to use this, to, to show us things in our lives that, that are, that are uh, hindering us in our faith. Will we allow God to use this furnace to draw us closer to Him, to strengthen our faith? Will we use this, this challenge, this difficulty, to be like Shadrach and Abednego and be different and not be like so many in the world right now that are panicking? But this is a great opportunity for us to stand out and be different and not be like the world in panic. But allow the world to see us showing by action that we truly trust God, that he, he can be trusted. This is a challenge. It is a comfort. This story reminds us that as we go through this fiery furnace, he is with us. He walks with us wherever we go. And he will use this somehow to do great things. I have no doubt that if we will allow God, and I, and I use that term very, very loosely, but uh, and very carefully, but if, if we will allow God to use this, this difficulty, he will come out stronger in the end. If, if we will take advantage of this opportunity that we are facing. And maybe today, this story convicts you. Because you don't know if you have faith. You know, the, the walk of faith starts with saving faith. And what is saving faith? Well, it's come to that place in life where you recognize that you've already, you've already um, caught the disease. There is a disease that all of us have. And that's the disease called sin. 
Every part of our being is affected by sin. And ultimately our sin is against God. And because we've sinned against God, we deserve to be judged by God and spend eternity in a, in a terrible place called hell. But the Bible gives us the good news. And that is God sent his only begotten son who was born of a virgin, who lived a perfect sinless life and died on the cross. And as he died on the cross, he died in our place. He paid the penalty for our sins. And on the third day, he rose again. And the Bible's invitation is very simple. Any who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so maybe this morning, this story convicts you that you need to experience saving faith. You want peace in your life. You want comfort in your life. You want to know, just like these three men, that no matter what happens in your life, ultimately, in the end, it's all going to be okay. Because you're safe in the arms of Jesus. And you can have that assurance by crying out to Jesus. By placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to pray and then we'll be through. Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this great story of faith through the lives of these three Jewish men. Lord, we thank you for their faith. We thank you for their courageous stand. We thank you that no matter what they were, they were threatened with even their own lives. They refused to bow to a false God. Lord, give us that kind of faith. And Lord, we thank you that you allow trials in our lives to, to grow us, to use us, to demonstrate faith to, to others. Lord, we thank you that when we stand confidently in our faith, others are encouraged in their faith. And so, Lord, we thank you. Lord, may we take advantage of this time, this opportunity, as we're walking through this fiery furnace. May we grow through the furnace. And, Lord, perhaps there are some that right now, under the sound of my voice, their greatest need is they need to be saved. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that they would cry out to you by faith today, that they would surrender their hearts and their lives to you to be the Lord of their lives. And then they can begin walking on this journey of faith. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God is good, and he is gracious. You know, the reality is even our faith is a gift from God, and we thank him for that. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. We'll be back this evening at 6 o'clock, where we will once again uh, worship the Lord, and then we'll go to God's word, and we'll be challenged out of his word. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.